challenge in song. We thank you for this report from India, the Middle East. We thank you for what you've done in so many lives. We see a lot of problems in the world. We see a lot of suffering. It's always there. We see a lot of great things that you're doing. And we thank you. We praise you. Lord, show us where we go from here. That we may do your will in a more wholehearted way in the months to come, the years to come. In Jesus' name, amen. That I want to share with you. And I've changed the title for this tape sheet. You know, the tape message here is very general, the challenge today. The challenge today is personal revival. I want to speak to you about the privilege of personal revival. And my text is Ephesians, and it's Ephesians chapter 2.
ships. Because they are two of the oldest ships in the whole world. And the miracle, I tell you, not those bits of steel. The miracle of the ship project. Pinky. Engineers, hard working, committed, born again believers, willing to work without a salary. Huh? Trusting the Lord for the own expenses. That's the miracle of the ship project. For those who talk to me. A long time about that. I hope you'll get that ship filled and show it in your church. Made by Dutch television. And we got so many audio visuals available on OM. And a lot of them sit on the shelf. Because so often we have so little initiative. Do you know, before I was saved, I was showing films for a missionary organization and raising money on their behalf. That's before I got saved. And I just can't understand how people can be saved and have so little vision, so little initiative, so little spiritual up, so little, so little spiritual get up and go. It must be a disease, a spiritual cancer, a spiritual anemia. And it just must break the heart of God if it's possible. My heart, as you can guess, is full. I was sharing how before when was an actual backslider. Maybe this is why I'm preaching to you and sharing with you on the subject of personal revival. Here we read, you have been made alive. Made alive. According to God's word, if you are a believer, if you have been born again, you are alive. I've studied revival. It's very interesting. I listen to lectures by Evan Hall, the great revival leader. I've heard Mr. Val Grieve, a lawyer from Manchester, the chairman of the board of EBA, the British company that owns the ship Lagos, speak of revival. I don't forget his message of revival. I've trudged the villages of Wales to some of those old churches where the 1904 revival broke out. And I believe God can do that again. I visited the Hebrides where they had a revival through the human instrumentation of dear Brother Duncan Campbell some years ago. And I think many of us, when we read these books and we hear what God has done in the past, we, we, we get into a, a mentality of thinking this is something we sort of hope for and long for, but there's really not much we can do. Now, this kind of revival, the 1904 revival, the revival that came through men like Whitfield, has so many things in the church. It's a controversy. So Finney believed there was a lot you could do about it. Others disagreed with Finney. I'm still longing to see revival in Britain. Maybe Mission England will lead to that. Evangelism is not necessarily revival. Church growth is not necessarily revival. Revival begins among God's people with deep conviction of sin and people getting right with the Lord. And then it spreads. It spreads in different ways at different times. I remember when there was a revival at Asbury College and Seminary. Dr. David Singlitz, the author of that book, that brilliant book, Healing for Damaged Emotions, one of the most significant books of our decade. His life and the life of his wife was completely turned around in the Asbury Revival. And I want you to pray. I want you to pray not only for pastors because they had such a difficult past. And you need to be loyal and love your pastor. Pastors try to understand the job they have. But you know, we need to pray more for the pastor's wives. Because I think it's one of the toughest jobs in the world to be the wife of a Christian leader or especially of a priest. People expect so much from Christian leaders. They've read so many books, reading too many books without getting out and putting it into practice yourself, develops a sort of uh, Disneyland form of Christianity. It's not real. It's interesting. It's exciting. You, you, you can enjoy it. It's, there's a lot to watch. It's not real. That's why when you read a book, then you need to go out and put it into practice. Thanks. 
exciting that I don't know what is exciting. Personal revival is the privilege of every believer by inheritance. You don't have to stand in a night of prayer to get this. In some people's case, it might be necessary. You don't have to wait. You don't have to read 16 books on sanctification. By the way, some people, with their particular mentality, the more books they read on sanctification,
because of their background, because of damaged emotions, because of psychological blockage and other difficulties at their conversion. There is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, because we have not the Spirit of Christ, we don't have Christ. But somehow, there is not much of the fullness, because there's just too much yet in the way, in terms of sin, in terms of difficulty, damaged emotions, a lot of other things. Go on, what you want. And so later on, the Lord touches them, and they have a second experience of grace. And for some people, that seems to be greater than almost when they were given. Don't be frightened by that. God works in different ways. I've had people tell me that their experience of the OM summer campaign, which is a training program, almost all of you, I'm sure, are eligible if you want to have on the field training, cross cultural evangelism, the life of prayer, developing your ability to relate to different people, have a discipline. Lots of openings yet for this summer. But I've had people write to me and say that their experience of evangelism and theme life on OM changed their life more than their conversion. Now that sounds really bizarre, doesn't it? But you know, all that was happening, it's simple. What God put in in conversion came out when they got out on the front lines of spiritual battle. It's not that OM had more. It's not that we have some special blessing package. It's that the situation, the circumstance, being thrown out in, in a situation where you have to trust God, it enabled that which was already in to come out. One of the great mistakes, I was about to tell you this in the beginning, I'm going to sidetrack but one of the great mistakes people make when they come out of heaven is to think that coming out of heaven, they will become spiritual. I want to tell you. Christ is the source of the spiritual life, not only. Others come out of and they get disappointed with their leader. They thought they were going to have a leader who was going to somehow be a combination of Hudson Taylor, C.T. Studd, Amy Carmichael, and E.T. And they found their leader was human, he was a failure, and uh, they were disappointed. They were, they were so looking forward to really being discipled by the spiritual heavyweight. I want to tell you, the source of discipleship is Jesus Christ. The source of spiritual life is Jesus Christ. And you can be as backslidden and as defeated on OM as, as a buddy going downhill on a pair of greasy skis. And that was ridiculous, wasn't it? I think sometimes I've said so many ridiculous things to try to make new comparisons because the last thing I want in my messages is for people to be born because I live with three children who are always telling me they're born. So I get into extremes. But uh, the source of spiritual life is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you study the Word of God, Christ is center. And if we're going to live out this spiritual revolution, then there has to be a fresh revelation of Jesus. The answer is not on a land. Don't come on a land if you think we're the, some kind of great answer. We're a fellowship of needy people learning how to obey God in discipleship. It's your privilege from the date of your conversion, whether anybody ever disciples you or not, whether you ever get into some sophisticated training program or not, whether you ever read all these great books or not, your privilege, your inheritance in Jesus Christ is life. Life. Abundant life, John chapter 10, verse 10 says, in those words, where Jesus speaks and says, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. That the enemy is trying to rob you of your inheritance. He's trying to get you to think in some future event. He's trying to get you discouraged with yourself so that you're always praying for some special blessing or for some revival or for some new experience or for some total cure discipleship program or for the perfect church or for the New Testament principles. And we get, as it says in Ephesians, blown about by every wind of doctrine. Every new speaker who comes into town with spiritual pet pills and a new chorus, we're blown this way. And we read another book and we're blown that way. And we fail to realize the simple truth of all that we have in Jesus Christ.
Because I believe if I can live this way, then you can live this way. Because I don't have any more than you. If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. You have Jesus Christ living in you. Now you can relax, he's not going to turn you into me. It's always, it's always pathetic to see some little, quiet, shy British girl trying to be some noisy, loud-mouthed, extrovert American male. Or trying to be a combination to get the you know, deal movie, Billy Graham, Billy Sunday, and whoever else. Women, just accept that femininity. It's beautiful. God made you equal. He made you special. He, he, he loves you as much as he loves any man. And if you want real women's liberation, then let Jesus Christ set you free. Because when you're free in Christ, you're free indeed. And there's a need for women today in God's work. And the teams that have impressed me the most in the past three years in OM are the women's teams out in Pakistan. We have in Jesus Christ, male or female, at the moment of our new birth, life. You know where I learned some of this from? Though it was happening in my life, I, I couldn't put a verbal handle on it. Until I came across this old southern preacher, Nancy Heffern. You ever heard him preach? The most blessed experience. You know, one thing we need to learn in the church is not to tear and compare preachers. There may be someone here that actually gets a bit turned off by my approach and the way I speak. Don't worry about it. We're all different. Some other preacher, if you stay in tune with the church and with God, he'll, he'll, he'll get free. We have a wide range of speakers in OM. We have at least 50 men now who feel their number one main ministry is the proclamation of the Word of God and evangelism and to believers. They're all different, and their approach is different. I hope you invite some of them to your churches. When Jerry Davey first stepped in as leader of SDL, he didn't think his main ministry was preaching. I'm sure he still doesn't think that. But when I was on the subcontinent recently, and I heard a report of a dynamic preacher in Bombay, I, I, I thought, well, look, you know, is this Ray Hiker? Is this Alfie Franks? Who's been down hitting the hit them in Bombay? And somebody said, it was Jerry Dean. Now they want to refine the Middle East. Not to give expert advice on the literature that we can do that, but they want to preach. See, so, you know, sometimes God surprises you. I'd love Jerry to give his testimony. God saved him out of a very introvert life as an engineer, master's degree in aeronautics engineering. He joined OM for a year to handle a greasy little dirty bookshop and a converted pump in Fulton. And ended up marrying one of the first American women ever to come into work. One of those international marriages. They're, 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 they're in OM like, 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 like babies. Yeah, maybe every four days, twins, waiting for quads and whatever else. It's a fruitful movement. It's also a controversial subject. Vance Hagner said we wouldn't have to talk so much about revival if we knew. Here's a new word, write it down. We'd like to give you new words in OM. Vival. Let's see if I can say that with a soda man saying. Vival. If you had Bible, you would need revival. You know, that simple message went through my heart like a bullet. And I saw it and I said, God, that's it. That's it. I'm alive in you. I don't have to keep waiting, keep hoping. Sure, the Lord will still give you special experience. The Lord will still give you moments of ecstasy in praise and worship. But that's what we're above the glass. The glass will be filled by Jesus himself. We are alive in Jesus Christ. We have Bible. Lord Jones emphasizes, this. I believe the greatest Christian book in the English language, and I'm not offering it free, is spiritual depression, its cause and cure. You go down to your bookshop and get that book. Greatest Christian book in the English language in the past 100 years. I've been saying that for many years. And I just can't express how much that book means to me. And in a sense, this message tonight, in 
different vocabulary is similar to what he puts in the book. You see, the Word of God says we have the mind of Christ. Have you read that verse? We have the mind of Christ. Now, there are many roads in life. And a lot of the battle of the Christian life is the battle of the mind. It's the battle of the mind. Freud says we don't really have much choice or program to a large degree. You love your mother, you hate your father, all my business. A lot of that has been even disproven by psychologists, or later, later be disproven by other psychologists. And someday they'll start reading the Bible. Because the psychology of Jesus, it's a beautiful book, the psychology of Jesus and mental health. I think we'll show you that the Sermon of the Mount has more basic biblical beautiful psychology than almost anything you could ever read. Read the sermon. Lloyd Jones emphasized the need to discipline our bodies, to discipline our mind. I put it this way, it comes to me. There are many roads. I, I'm tempted. You get many temptations. I'm a person of tremendous temptation. How many of you have temptations more or less every, say every
None of these diseases and the Mount Everest and medical writing. And I knew that I had to stop walking down Negative Street. Now, I wonder how many of you have been down Negative Street this week, this month. Maybe you like your parents. So easy to be, to be negative about your parents. You think God gave you the wrong parents? We expect so much from our parents. I thank God for the day that I accepted my parents as they were. Partly the result of that both of them came to know Jesus Christ. And I will tell you, we are living in a day in which parents are under tremendous pressure. Many of them are running to psychiatrists and psychologists. And I believe today, your parents need you and your love and your acceptance of them. More than you'll ever know. More than you'll ever know. But how easy it is to go down Negative Street about our family, about the problems in the home, about the time you, times you were hurt. And as we walk down Negative Street, there are the little, the little fire hydrants of, of hurtness. And then we, we turn, them, turn the water on and let it squirt out, but instead of water, it's acid. And I would beg of you in the name of Jesus, if you've been down that street, you see how depressing, you see how wrong it is, don't go down anymore. Don't go down anymore. Determined by the mind of Jesus Christ, by the control of the Holy Spirit in your life, because there is such a thing as a spirit-controlled life, you're not going down Negative Street anymore. You're not going down Cynic's Alley anymore. You're not going down Judgmental Square anymore. By God's grace, you're going to stay on the highway of holiness. By, by God's grace, you're going to stay on that, that avenue of spiritual revolution, 1 Corinthians 13 where there's blessing, where there's daily revival, where there's forgiveness, where there's grace and mercy abounding to the chief of sinners. That's what the Christian faith is all about. And you make the decision. Not me, not your church, not your leader. You make the decision. What you do with your mind and how you live your life because Christ is in you, according to the word of God, the hope of glory. No training program that can match that. There's no experience that can match that. There's no worship session that can match that. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And it's yours to the degree that you simply stand upon it, claim it, and live in the light of it. What about old Temper Street? You ever, 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 and you get down to Temper Street? You know, people that don't have trouble with temper, your problem is something else. I don't know if you can realize the horribleness of temper. I know. Because I'm a man that's fought temper all my life. Anger, explosiveness. I almost completely overthrew the Christian. Because I couldn't get victory over temper. And long after I was getting upset so much with people, I get upset with myself. Especially if I lost something. Do you like to lose things? Do you like to lose your wallet? Your money? That's a nice experience. You lose all your money. And then you claim, in the name of Jesus, it's going to return. You heard the testimony of that guy who prayed. He lost it and he found it. And you prayed. You even had the laying on of hands. In the name of Jesus. That was 20 years ago. You still haven't found it. Temper is a terrible thing. I never forget reading Billy Graham's book, Seven Deadly Sins, one of the most powerful books I've ever read, at least in the top 50. I just read reading it again the other day. Seven Deadly Sins. And he speaks about the sin of anger. I'm not only indebted to Billy Graham for my conversion. Billy Graham was the major teacher in my life. He's not just an evangelist. Have you read his books? He's a teacher. He's a, you know, how do you explain Billy Graham? And he teaches line on line in his own unique way. And his messages are dealing with anger. When I read it, I repented and I recommitted my life to Jesus Christ. And God has given more and more and more victory. Many, many months pass often without any 
first attempt on my part. Your irritability is still a struggle? But you see, I know Temper Street. I know it's down it. I know the people I can hurt down that street. I know I can hurt my own children. I can hurt my own life. And by God's grace, I'm not going down that street anymore. And maybe you think I'm a little extreme, but if you don't get extreme in hatred of sin and in hatred of the things you do that hurt people and destroy people, then I don't think you'll know the holiness of God in a long-term life. It was because at 19 and 18, I hated immorality and I hated evil and I hated injustice that my whole life was changed by God's power. And the Bible says that in the book of Romans. Hate that which is evil and cling to that which is good. You don't have to do it as emotionally as me. You can be phlegmatic, you can be cool and calm, you can even mix in there a little bit of sanguine. I don't care how you do it, just do it. I love the quiet types. I Walter, I worship at the altar of the quiet types. That's why one of my main goals in OM is to get as many quiet, disciplined, long-term church planting among the Muslim phlegmatics as I possibly can. And I'll give myself to recruiting and blowing my trumpet and sticking and stirring people until they decide they're going to do something, even if it's just to get me off their back. That's very poor motivation, by the way, for world missions. You know what the streets are in your life that lead you to sin, lead you to depression, lead you to discouragement, lead you to unbelief. To just walk into a bookshop and pick up a book by a leading agnostic, a leading humanist, and read it before you know the Word of God, before you know Christian apologetics, you're asking for trouble. To go into university and study psychology under some warped, semi-demented atheist, without knowing the Word of God, without knowing the reasons for your Christian faith, is a very foolish thing to do, because there is a real devil, and there's no purpose in walking right into his oven and pouring, pouring, pulling, pulling the door closed on you. I don't know if you've ever had the oven experience, but the devil knows how to do it. The Bible says, Satan has a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour. Do you believe that? It says that we should hold high the shield of faith wherewith we can stop the fiery darts of the devil. Young person, if you and I go down that road, another dangerous road, of just playing church, of just listening to messages and never putting them into action into our lives, of just listening to the words of Jesus who said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up the cross and follow me, if we just continue to listen and we don't act, we will dig a ditch deeper than we can ever measure. Young person, revival is your privilege. And I share this carefully. Perhaps it's to bring other things into balance. As far as I can remember, every day since my conversion, I have known this revival. Now that needs a lot of explaining. And I'm running short on time, and I'm trying to lure you into some of these cassettes. Because I believe that cassette Bible ministry can be a great opportunity, especially for some of you who may not be able to get what I had as a privilege two years in Bible college. Many of you will get that, I'm sure, as well. But I believe I need to say it even though it's risky, because it's true. Every day since my conversion, I've known revival. Not sinlessness. Oh, my. I've sinned my tongue, my eyes, my thoughts. But you see, revival is not lived in the absence of sin. Revival is lived in dealing with sin and repenting with sin. It's First John chapter 2, verse 1. First part of the verse, sin not. Second part of the verse, if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If you don't write anything down, write First John chapter 2, verse 1, because it's the anchor of continuous revival. And the book I was going to offer you is called Personal Revival. We have it in magazine form. It won't cost us much. If you feel bad about that, you can send the postage. But read that little book, Personal Revival, by Stanley Vogt. Read Roy Eschen's powerful little spiritual dynamite, Calvary Road, now in 35 languages. I've watched this man's life ever since I came to Britain and met him, and I believe Roy Eschen is another example that you can live in continuous revival. You're not always at the same level. The joy isn't always the same. The worship capacity is not 
not always the same. Your feelings go up and down. I've had days in which I've been down, but even when I've been down, I've been worshiping, I've been thanking Jesus, I've been battling through unbelief, I've been pulling myself back from the tangents of evil. And I've gone to bed knowing I'm forgiven. He's in my heart. He's alive, even though I may feel dead. Revival doesn't liquidate the human factor in your life. This is a great mistake. We think if we become spiritual, we get a different voice. We'll, we'll never feel discouraged again. We'll never really be tempted in the same way. We won't do some of those terrible things around the house. But you see, as spirit-filled believers, we're still human. We still easily fail. We're, we're vulnerable. And sometimes soldiers in the battle, now under pressure, winning men for Christ, we're more vulnerable. Some of you are, who have recommitted your life in these days, you will go from here more vulnerable. And so if you have a big failure in the next couple of weeks, that's not the end of the road. That's probably a green light that you're on the right road. And the devil's after you. Rebound. One sport that never came to England much, though it's come more lately, is basketball. Have any of you ever seen a basketball game at all? Raise your hand. This was my favorite sport. This is encouraging. But the key in basketball you shoot for the basket. If you miss, you try to get the rebound. Have you ever seen these tall fellas? I always wanted to be tall. I actually got thrown off the team for fooling around. It's before I was saved. You know, I don't fool around now that I'm saved. And uh, anyway, you shoot the basket. If it misses, one of these tall fellows leaps in the air and taps it. Have you ever seen that? And it goes in. That's called a rebound. And in our Christian life, we've got to learn how to rebound. You try something in your Christian life, you fail. Try again. Don't give up. You're in God's training program. It's a long-term program. And I sense that some of you have given up in some area of struggle in your life. Don't do it. It's deadly. Claim His grace right now as we bring this to a close. Ask Him for fresh mercy. Believe with the depth of your being, you are cleansed, you are as white, as beautiful, as snow that's touched the tops of the Himalayas because of Christ. Personal revival, daily joy, daily reality and witness in prayer, in relationship, in the midst of struggle and failure in the human factor is the privilege of every believer. Some of us need a little Holy Ghost stubbornness to stand on this verse and a hundred similar verses and say, Lord, by your grace, every day from now on, hear us. Come what may. Pain or pleasure. Wind or the calm. Here I stand. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your labor is never in vain. That's God's word. Let us pray. I wonder how many of you in these past weeks, again and again, you've been going down the side roads, the roads of lust, the streets of anger or depression, jealousy, and you're discouraged. You're defeated. You're not living in the promised land. Milk and honey. Fruit of the Holy Spirit. And God somehow this afternoon has touched your heart. And there's a cry, there's a sob in your heart. And you want to say, oh God, by your grace, from this day on, I will live on the basis of my inheritance. Will you do that? take that stand and by His grace from now on it's going to be promised land living it's going to be personal revival as your privilege through His indwelling Holy Spirit if you want to make a recommitment to Jesus and to live daily on the basis of this personal revival that's yours in Christ if you
you mean it with all your heart and you want to come back to the cross and be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit this afternoon. To be his soldier, to be his disciple, to go where he wants you to go, to do what he wants you to do. Then I want you quietly in this great church, just quietly to stand on your feet and say, Lord, touch me. Revive me. And as you pray that, you will make your commitment that you'll live in the light of that by his mercy and grace every day of your life. I believe some of you need to get on this road of personal revival by simply believing God's word and taking a stand that this is where you will live. God's highway. No more side roads. No more streets. That you've already been there. You know what's there. By the mind of Jesus, an act of the will, you will turn and put your focus upon Christ and you'll never turn back. The title of that little book. You'll make that decision you made a similar decision last night, but many were not there. Others have been thinking about it. Then I want you right now, we're not going to take long, to just stand where you are and ask God to make this real, more real than ever before. Realizing a large part of the work is on your part. God bless you. Praise God. Any others? This is only a step. The message is made in clear not giving out an experience that's going to make it easy. But you're taking a step of faith, an act of the will, to move in personal revival. Really, standing up is an acknowledgement that there's faith in your heart. There's, there's a ring of reality in what you've heard, and you say, Lord, yes, it's me you're, you're speaking to. Not just this great crowd, it's me. You want me to live in the promised land. You want me to live in victory and power. And spiritual growth. Praise God. God bless you. Any others? Young couples, do you have revival in the home? That's God's will. Revival in the home. It's not perfection, but it's reality. The joy of many of the meetings I've had lately. I've had 110 meetings in the last two and a half months. What a joy, what a privilege to see young couples standing, getting their marriages right by putting the marriage on a solid rock. Inheritance in Jesus Christ. Forgiveness. Forgiving your partner of anything she has ever done against you. Just as Christ has forgiven you. Totally. That's what we need. We're going to have revival at home. And have, of course, much more. God bless you. I'm going to pray a prayer of commitment. But if there's anyone else, standing up will help you remember this day. Be an affirmation of faith. Saying yes to what the Spirit of God is convicting you about. Anyone else? Yes, God bless you. Praise the Lord. Many people are praying for this conference. This is not a sort of an instant thing we're doing right now. Many, many are praying. You've thought about this. And the bell has rung in your heart. You're saying yes. Yes. From this, the Lord may lead you to the mission field, or he may lead you to stay right here in England. His will be done. First things first, not geography, reality. Reality. I'd rather know reality and be in my home country than be a misfit missionary at the ends of the earth and not have the reality and the revival bells ringing in my heart. Just one last one, anybody else who may be wrestling. Just stand to your feet right now. God bless you. In the back. On the side. <clears throat> yes. So come. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes. Father, you see each one of us standing before you. We're all different. And you're not trying to run us through some kind of stereotype to program. You love us. We know that spiritual reality and reality is found in you. Not in man, not in movements. In you. You will use men. You will use the church. You will use books. You will use movements. But Lord, we acknowledge you as the source of all life and the source of revival. 
and more than that, of vital. And by faith, Lord, we, we take this scripture and we believe we're alive. We're alive. We're alive in you. And we will now live that way. We will now live in the light of that. And we'll not be sidetracked into the, the dead end street of lust, into the alley of depression, into the back lane of, of anger or fear. But by your grace, we will stay on this highway of holiness, this royal road of spiritual revolution, reality, love. Granted, God, by your grace, we every day we will do our part. But we pray in the powerful name of him who lives in our hearts, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us all stand and just sing that chorus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. He is the source of that power. Claim it. He wants to bless you. He wants to fill you with his Holy Spirit. So as we sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus and bring the meeting to a close with that. Let's believe it with all of our hearts. who stood and made this step of faith, I would like you to give me a little piece of paper for my own use and my little team, people that work with me, to pray for you at least once, to send you literature you want. But if you stood, since I'm getting a lot of different feedback, just say, I believe in God. Personal revival. Use that word, personal revival. I'll know you stood at this meeting, and I'll send you automatically that book by Stanley Volk on personal revival. He doesn't express it the same way I do. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I haven't got to give you vocabulary. Don't got to have vocabulary. Just let Jesus live out through you. In a sense, it means being yourself, accepting yourself, be your repent, and just obey, grow, repent, grow. Bow on to him who is able to make these truths a reality in our hearts on a seven-day week basis. To our great God and our great Savior, the Lord Jesus.